Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's Go Fly Master Lecture. To get us started, I'm going to pass it over to Gwen Leiter to uh, get us kicked off here. Gwen? Thank you for joining us for today's Master Lecture, and thank you, Paul. Uh, we are thrilled today to welcome Lori Hoberman uh, to give today's Master Lecture. As you all know, Boeing's grand, <laughs> excuse me there, Go Fly's grand sponsor is Boeing. And we are joined uh, by several in-kind sponsors as well as organizational partners uh, together to help all of our teams as they create transformative technology. We are thrilled today to welcome Lori Hoberman. Lori is the founder of Hoberman Law Group. She is a well-known force in the New York City venture community. As a lawyer and as a mentor, she advises entrepreneurs and their investors on how to build successful businesses and strategically guides them through emerging, later stages, and the exits of their companies. Lori works with clients in a range of industries, including software, mobile, biotechnology, AI, fintech, insurtech, fashion, e-commerce, consumer products, and advertising. She also counsels angels and institutional investors in their investments and in the formation of investment funds. Lori was co-founder of mobile advertising company Mojiva Inc. and is an angel investor. She is a frequent speaker and media resource on entrepreneurialism. She is a mentor to 37 Angels, serves as an advisor to the Queens College Tech Incubator, and formerly chaired the New York City chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum. After years of running venture practices in several New York City law firms, Lori launched the Hoberman Law Group in the fall of 2014. As the Huffington Post headlined, a New York lawyer popular with entrepreneurs becomes one herself. And so without further ado, we are thrilled to welcome Lori Hoberman today to give the master lecture. Thanks, Lori, for joining us. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, Paul. All right, let's pull up. Let's pull up these slides. Okay. All right, Gwen, Paul, can you see this? Yep, we can see. Awesome. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. Ah, no good, no good. <laughs> okay. All right. So I thought it would be uh, a good place to start right at the beginning. And I have too much going on here on the screen. Hold on a second. Okay. So what type of entity should you form to build a business from? Clearly limited liability. So outside the US, it's an entity that gives your members, your shareholders, uh, limitation on liability just to the extent of the amount they've invested. Very important. And that could be a limited company, it could be an LTD, it could be a limitada, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. You're in the US, we're talking either a corporation or a limited liability company. And most of our clients start out as a limited liability company. It's more favorable from a tax perspective. It allows you as an investor, you as a founder to use your losses directly. It's better from a tax standpoint. The LLC is not taxed. There's a lot of flexibility in an LLC. The downside, a big downside of an LLC is that venture funds generally will not invest in an LLC. So, you end up converting to a corporation, usually right before you would bring on board a money from a venture fund. Some companies, though, like to start out right from the beginning as a corporate entity. It's still okay. It's simple to form. It's VC friendly. It gives you clearly the limitation on liability, same as an LLC. The downside is it's double taxation. If for some reason you're fortunate enough in the very beginning to be generating profit, that profit gets taxed both at the corporate level and then when the corporation distributes profits to you, pay tax. So it's just better to start off. It's more, more tax efficient, the LLC, but the likelihood is you're going to end up in a corporate entity regardless. Uh, we always form in Blair. So here in the US, there is of choice. It is really weird, right? Jurisdiction 
to form an entity. Sometimes we work with people who have formed maybe here in New York. Um, sometimes Nevada is a good, a good place to form from a tax standpoint. But what happens with investors is they all want you to be in Delaware. So we try to start off in Delaware. Several reasons for that. It's a very well established law. Uh, investors are familiar with it. It gives maximum protection for investors and directors from a liability standpoint. And it's really easy to file there. So uh, we highly recommend starting in Delaware. And the way you can do it, you can always do the filing yourself, but you could also work with one of the, the filing services. I'm sure everybody's heard of LegalZoom. There's many others. CSC is a group called Platinum. Any one of these services for a small fee will file the, the form for you. And it really is a simple form. If it's a corporate entity or an LLC at the very beginning, it's one page, you file it, you set up the company, you designate the right number of shares. And, uh, and that's how you begin. Couldn't be easier, an hour of time. Um, one trick to make sure that you're aware of when you're setting up a corporation. So corporations and LLCs, corporations in Delaware pay franchise taxes, annual franchise tax. Delaware has a very mechanical way of calculating that franchise tax. It's generally three different ways of doing it, but one of the ways is based on the number of shares you have authorized versus outstanding. It's very important not to authorize millions and millions of shares if you don't expect to issue all of them, because you can, you can trip up on this particular way that Delaware calculates taxes. So, when you create a corporation, you want to issue enough shares with a nice buffer, but make sure that you're issuing at least half of the shares you're authorized. In need of and open it, you it takes five minutes to get your employer identification number from the IRS. Just go online, irs.gov, and it's uh, it's very simple to get that. Hey, hey, Lori. Yeah? You, we're having a little bit of bandwidth problems, uh, so I might turn off your video and see if that makes your audio more clear. Oh, okay. Is is it on my, it might be it's my end, I don't know. Cool. Let me know. Let me try here. Yeah, good. Let's, uh, let's keep going and uh, we'll see how it is. Okay. All right, can you still see my screen? Yes, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about startups coming out of universities. Very common uh, to have technology be developed in universities and then done by students, by professors, either way, uh, very common. And then universities have all different types of tech transfer policies around what happens to that IP that's developed. It's important to make sure that whatever entity you're forming actually owns that IP. And in that case, you have to deal with the parameters that are set up by the university. So does the university want ownership in the entity that has the IP? Uh, does the university want the right to issue that IP or grant that IP to other entities? A lot of things to think about in that case. So you generally end up granting equity to a university in exchange for what hopefully should be exclusive IP rights. If you can't get full ownership of it, it should be exclusive in your, um, in your industry. And it should be very clear that you have it exclusive in your industry. You want to make sure that the university can't assign those IP rights to any other entities. The next step, once you get your company off the ground, uh, if, if you're moving forward in a solid way, you're going to want to hire people, but you might not have the money to do it. So there's always the grant of equity. To, to bring on board employees. And that's, that's really how most companies start. Most companies have a founder or two, and maybe there's a, an extended beginning team. Could be that the, that extended beginning team comes on board as employees, and you're gonna issue them equity from the company. If you're a corporation, you issue options or restricted stock. If you're an LLC, you're is, issuing profits units. So as a corporation, let's, we'll stick to corporation for a moment. It's typical to set aside 
somewhere between 10% and 20% for employee compensation. And that should cover you probably for the first year or two of your business. Um, maybe longer, depending on how much of your management team is actually your founding group. The standard vesting terms, the so standard four-year vesting with a one-year cliff, which means if you're granting somebody an option to acquire, let's just say 4% of the company, what would happen is one-fourth of that, or 1%, would vest on the first anniversary of the grant date. That's your one-year cliff. It gives you one year to test out whether you like this employee without actually getting married and granting them equity in the company, which sometimes is hard to unwind. So you would have the one-year cliff, and then vesting would continue uh, generally over the next three years, either at a quarterly, in a quarterly way, so an additional portion would vest at the end of each quarter of continuing service, or it would vest the same thing monthly, depending on how quickly you want to vest it. I typically do quarterly because I think it's easier from an administrative standpoint. Something to remember is that most venture funds invest only on a fully diluted basis. So that means that all options and warrants and convertible notes, anything that is not truly equity but has the ability to convert to equity is considered outstanding. So if you've set aside 10% of the company for grant to employees, but you've only granted 2% of that, you're still gonna be treated as almost granting, it's really granting the remaining 10%, that remaining, that remaining 8%, sorry, the whole 10% will be treated as outstanding for purposes of determining the VC's investment. So I think it's really important, don't give away too much equity to employees or consultants. There, there may be this feeling when you have an employee who comes to you and says, all right, I'm willing to forgo a salary, but I want equity instead. Uh, you might be so thankful to hear that, that you wanna give them a huge chunk of equity. Don't do that. Uh, the equity is the most valuable thing you have in your company. It's far easier to pay somebody than to an employee or a consultant than to give them a huge chunk of your equity. And, and just to give you an idea, so general guidelines of how, how to issue equity, these are C-level grants and an advisory board grant. They're small and you try to really keep them in this range. This, these are New York City guidelines. So if you were to go out and hire a CEO, and it, this also depends on the timing at which you're hiring them, but if you were to hire them kind of early on in the company, a typical grant of eight to 10% would be pretty standard. CFO, the one and a half percent to 3%, uh, chief operating officer, two to 4%, maybe 5%, depending on how active they are in the business. Chief revenue sales strategy, three to 5%. Chief technology officer, typically in a tech company, the CTO is the most valuable person after the CEO, sometimes more valuable than the, the, uh, the CEO. I had a client who used to joke that when they were crossing the street together, him and his CTO, he would literally throw himself in front of the bus rather than the CTO. So CTO is usually, maybe could be the more valuable person. Uh, six to 8%, typically could be more. An advisory board member uh, gets very little. What you expect from an advisory board member is to the ability to use the person's name. Maybe the person will make some introductions for you. Maybe they'll be helpful in the industry. The ideal advisory board member is somebody who has industry expertise and, and knows, um, knows people to help make things happen with your company. Somebody who has name recognition. So if an investor is looking at your advisory board, they recognize the names, it gives you some credibility. That's the ideal advisory board member. So you generally don't expect too much from them. Maybe you'll have a meeting once a year, twice a year. So the grant to them is very small, uh, ha half a percent, no, really no more than half a percent, and somewhere between one fourth and one half a percent. And that would vest as well. The, the goal is to really grant equity like this to employees that's always subject to vesting. And employees, advisors, consultants, it, it gives you a good chance to sample whether they're really right for you. And if they're not, you can, you can get rid of them and then you're not giving away too much equity in the company. I'm gonna come back to this, this idea that the equity is really important for you. 
Let's talk a little bit about the types of different types of equity compensation. These are the most common types. There's other things you can do as well, but these three are the most common type in a corporation. So you have incentive stock options, which are the best employees. There's grant or exercise, and there's only a tax on sale. So that's a really sweet deal for somebody who gets options. They must be a issue at market value price. Uh, and the also is a whole host of purpose around how you have options in order for them to really be incentive stock. Uh, Non-statutory stock options are what you can issue to advisors or directors or consultants, those people who are not employees of the company. They're not as favorable as the incentive stock options because there is a tax when you exercise. So you're basically taxed on the, in, the excess of the fair market value over the exercise price. But there's no tax on grant. And so sometimes recipients of, of non-statutory or non-incentive stock options, especially directors, or advisors who might be in the higher net worth brackets, they may ask to exercise when they receive it. Because when they receive it, fair market value is equal to exercise price, there's no tax. It also starts what we would call a capital gains clock ticking, so that it does create some benefits from them, for them. The other type of equity that's common in the early, early stages of the business where there's really no value to the stock is restricted stock. It's basically a, a grant of, of outright stock. So in an option, the holder has to pay to exercise the option and receive the stock. In a grant of restricted stock, the recipient is just receiving the stock outright. And it has to be issued um, at fair market value because the IRS taxes it. This is why it's a, a type of grant that you really see at the beginning of the company when the company is very low in value. Um, the IRS taxes the recipient on the vested value. So if it's vesting over time, you're really not taxed on much, but there's a handy dandy IRS election called the 83B election. And what, what you get to do with the 83B election is within 30 days of receiving restricted stock, you file this with the IRS and you tell the IRS, I'm willing to pay tax on the whole value today even though it's not vested today. But I'm willing to pay tax on the whole value today because I believe the value of the company is gonna go up. The alternative, if you don't file the 83B election, you're actually taxed on each day that the, um, that the a piece of the equity vests. So in the example we talked about before, if it's a one year cliff, you're actually taxed on that one year anniversary on the value that's vested on that one year anniversary. If the company has gone up in value, it can be a huge tax with no cash to pay the tax. So 83B election is really valuable. Uh, another thing we should talk a little bit about is how do you protect your IP from walking out the door with your employees? And I know that, that uh, there was a patent lecture, that's the best way to do it. Uh, one of the things to start very early on, as soon as you hire somebody, whether they're an employee or a consultant, you need a proprietary invention assignment agreement. And that's a PIIA, proprietary information, I looked at the word information, proprietary information invention assignment agreement. Every employee, every consultant must sign one. In fact, when you bring on board venture money, uh, you're gonna get a document called a stock purchase agreement that will require you to represent that every employee and consultant from the beginning of time has signed the PIIA. So a very important document. Uh, it, it, it tells the world and your employees and consultants that anything they develop belongs to the company. Uh, protecting your IP from third parties, the patent applications, trade secrets, license agreements, all of this tells the world that it's your IP. On the patent application side, I know that you discussed this, make sure that you don't blow the disclosure window. So what many of my clients do especially in the early stages when cash is tight, is they file what's called a provisional patent. And that gives you a little more time 
to, uh, to wait to actually convert it into what would be called a utility patent, which will cost more money, but at least it gives you a placeholder. So it's a very useful thing to do. Another thing you need to think about when you're building a business is creating a board of directors. And that's different from the board of advisors. The advisors don't have any say in the management of the company. The directors actually govern the business. So in the very beginning, when you're first starting out, you might not have a board of directors. It might be the founding team. You can call yourselves technically the board of directors. But what tends to happen is when you bring on board those first investors, they may ask for a seat on the board. Once you have an outside investor on the board, you wanna make sure that you at least have two of the founding team and the outside investor. That's why three is a good number. You could go up to five and put some independence on the board. But it's, it's good in the beginning to try to have your founding team control the board of directors. It's helpful not to give up control. The directors serve a very important role. They have to act in a fiduciary capacity to the company. It means that they can't make decisions that benefit themselves selfishly. Their decisions have to be made in the best interests of the company and its shareholders. And that raises a lot of issues for directors. Sometimes you'll have an investor who doesn't want a seat on the board because they want to be able to act more selfishly. So uh, but the board of directors is a very important, uh, it's, that's the governing body of your company. And they are uh, subject to personal liability, which is why we're gonna talk about uh, directors and officers insurance. You, you really need to have what's called D and O, directors and officers insurance. There's a whole host of ways that directors could be liable, personally liable. Uh, if they breach their duty of care, their, their fiduciary duty, a director can even be liable in New York if the company fails to pay its, the salaries to meet its payroll obligations. There's a lot of ways that directors have liability, which is why we recommend that you seek D&O insurance for your directors. And you'll find that directors, some of them, especially coming from funds uh, or maybe higher will refuse to sit on a board without the company having directors and officers insurance. And it's not, it's not difficult to get. Okay, so you've hired your employees, you've started building out your, your product, you've protected your IP, and it's time to start raising money to build the business. It is best to bootstrap for as long as possible. So the, the further along you take your business, the best part is really to take it to a place where you have a prototype to show an investor. Uh, the further along you can do that, the better off you're gonna be. It will make it easier to fundraise, and fundraising is never easy, but it will make it easier if you have more of a story to share with your potential investors. Um, first funding round, usually from friends and family. And that makes it easier. If you're lucky enough to have friends and family that have disposable income to share with you, and most importantly, you can sleep at night taking money from them, then they're the right place to start. If you're too uncomfortable taking money or asking for money from friends and family, then that's not gonna be the right way. But I will tell you, it is the easiest way to raise from the beginning. Okay, so most common types of initial funding. Most common we see, we do convertible notes and we do safes. And basically a safe, a simple agreement for future equity is a convertible note without the interest or maturity date. A convertible note is a document where somebody gives you the company money and you tell that person, we're gonna use this money now and we're gonna convert you when the company does its real equity round, whether it's a series seed, or a series A, we're gonna convert you when the company does that equity round. And you're gonna get not just the conversion, but you're gonna get a discount on that conversion. The standard terms for a convertible note is a discount of anywhere from 10 to 20%, and usually a pre-money value cap. Usually you give your investor the benefit of whichever option gets the investor the most shares on conversion. And by pre-money value cap, what I mean is you would pick a, a dollar value for the company. Like the nice, 
the nice thing about a convertible note is that you don't need to value the company at that point. You don't need to place a value. So you would, um, and that's why most of most beginning rounds of funding start off as convertible notes because there's no need to value the company, which at the very beginning stages, you have no value. So you avoid having to sell, you, you avoid giving away too much of the company. So to determine a pre-money value cap, you generally look opportunistically at what your series seed equity round, your first equity round would be, and that should be where your pre-money value cap is. So you tell a convertible note investor or a safe holder, safe investor, that you're gonna, you're gonna convert them at either a discount of 10 to 20%, whatever number you pick, or that pre-money value cap, whatever gets them the most number of shares on conversion. The beautiful thing about convertible notes or safes is that they are simple and easy and inexpensive, especially from a legal fee standpoint. They're, they're cheap from a legal fee standpoint. They don't take a lot of time to get done. It's a five page document as opposed to an equity round, which could be five separate documents of 25 pages each. So it's a much easier way to start, especially at this stage, the company doesn't have a lot of money to spend. Uh, it's, this, is, this is the way to go. It's the way we do all our initial funding rounds. The next funding round, which is your priced equity, is a series seed. Uh, series seed preferred stock. And then it's followed at some point by series A. Sometimes we have clients that do multiple seed rounds before getting to A. And what we're seeing in the industry is it's a progression. It used to be there was no series seed and you'd go right to a series A. Um, and series A could be as small as a $3 million round on let's say a six or $7 million pre-money value. That's not the case anymore. Those are series seed rounds and you can have multiple seed rounds before you get to an A. And typically an A now is much higher in pre-money value. Um, so, so the difference between the seed and the A, the seed is kind of a more user-friendly type of stock. It's, it's maybe less offensive veto rights, less offensive voting rights. They may not ask for a board seat. Um, it's usually non-participatory preferred stock, which means it's usually stock that says, preferred stock that says, okay, you'll either get your money back that you invested, that's your preference, or you'll be treated as though you've converted to common if that gets you more. Um, it's, it's still full deal documents, but it's less onerous than the A. So we find that, that we have, I, I have clients with uh, multiple series seed rounds. We're doing a series seed three right now. Um, so this is the general, uh, the general way that you're raising money, the convertible note first or the safe and then the series seed and then the, Series A. Really good rule of thumb is don't give away too much significant, don't give away too much equity at that first equity funding round. If you're able to sell less than a third of the company at that first funding round, including note conversion, that's awesome. Even 40%, if you're able to sell less than 40%, that's still really good. Uh, you don't want to give away too much because the likelihood is you're going to do subsequent rounds of funding. And as you do those rounds of funding, you get diluted more and more. And you as the management, as the founding team, you don't, want, you don't want to be diluted down to nothing at the time you're finally ready to sell the company. So you want to think of that and plan, uh, plan intelligently as you're going along. Just some quick uh, defined terms. <laughs> we talked a little bit about pre-money value. So some quick math. Pre-money value is the value of your company today before the investment comes in. So pre-money value plus investment equals post-money value. So quick math, so an investment of a million dollars on a $2 million pre-money value gives the investor one third of your company. So the investor put in a million, post-money is three million, one over three, one third of the company. The pre-money value is usually the most hotly negotiated point in a term sheet because it clearly determines how much the investor gets. I'm often asked, how do you determine pre-money value? Especially for a company that has no revenue. You don't, there's no, uh, 
you can't really do a 12 trailing 12 month revenue analysis. It's really hard to do that. Uh, it, and you know, this is a bit of a joke here, but it is truly as arbitrary at times as throwing darts. Uh, your potential venture investors have an idea of what they expect to invest, whether it's a series C round or a series A round, they have an idea what they expect to invest at from a pre-money value standpoint. And so they have a sense of where it should rationally be, but you'll need to show some means of support. And usually it's, uh, it's projected revenue. Could be if you have some small revenue, maybe it's trailing six months and it's forward looking six months. You could look at comparable companies, although that's not always the best. And so it is a hotly negotiated point. And the more you can back up, the more you, you've done your research and you own your financial numbers and you're comfortable speaking about them, the easier this discussion will be. So it's one thing to negotiate well on, on that whole pre-money value uh, thing, but you have to keep in mind the concept of full dilution. So we talked a little bit about the option pool before. The option pool is dilutive and it's dilutive to the founding team initially. And when you bring on board investors, the investors want to make sure that they are not diluted for your option pool. So a typical term for a series seed or a series A investment will be the percentage that you have to set aside in your option pool, whether it's 10% or 15% or, or less than that. The investors generally look to see whether you filled in your C-suite, so your C-level employees, your CTO, your CFO, your COO, those are usually the big ticket hires, both, both from a salary perspective and from an option perspective, or an equity grant perspective. So depending on how well you flesh those out, you will not, it, it's, it's, um, you'll need to account for that to the investors in terms of the option pool you're gonna set aside and it will impact your dilution. So in, if you bring in that million dollars that we spoke about on the last slide on a 2 million pre-money value, but the investor requires that you set aside a 10% option pool before that investment, you're actually giving away 43% of the company. The investor's getting their one third, but you're setting aside 10% in the option pool. And that's dilution that is only felt by the existing owners, so usually the founding team. Uh, some investors, although not many, <laughs> may be willing to have the option pool set up after their investment, which means that you both share in the dilution for that option pool. What we find is sometimes later on in, in the company's life where you're doing your series B, sometimes investors are willing to share in future option grant dilution. Most of the time in those early stages, they want to be protected for it. How do you find your VCs? Uh, each VC has its own or your investors. How do you find your investors, whether they're funds or angel investors? Each investor has their own list of what they look for in a deal. So know your audience when you're trying to target those right parties. If you're, if, if you're developing a flying car, don't go to those investors who want biotech. And you can do your research. You can look on their websites. There's so many different tools now that you can use to find out who, who to target for an investment. There are early stage investors that, that won't look at later stage companies and vice versa. There are investors that won't do debt, they'll only do equity. There, there's a lot that you need to learn about the investors and, and it's, it shows an element of respect if you do your homework before you go, you go after them. Where do you find them? So best introduction to an investor comes from somebody who knows you and them. So it's not a cold call. So, um, that usually is one of your service providers, whether it's your attorney, your accountant, uh, maybe somebody on your board of advisors. There are definitely people out there that are professional fundraisers. What I have found is in the early stages of building a company, the early, early venture investors are less likely to uh, listen to a professional fundraiser. Professional fundraisers take fees. Some of those fees are pretty steep. 
And those early stage VCs, they're not putting in millions and millions of dollars. They want to know that the money they're investing in you is going to grow the company, not to pay professional fundraisers. So I, I don't, the, those early stages, I'm not sure how useful those professional fundraisers are. I, I feel completely differently when you get to a stage where you're ready to sell the company much later. And then to be able to run a process with uh, a, a professional investment banker, that's much more valuable. But those early stages, I think in the early stages, it's important to show your scrappiness and creativity in finding these investors. And there are databases out there. There's TechCrunch, Helps, Capital IQ, Venture Source. There are definitely ways to find uh, people who will invest in you. Networking events. It's, it's not easy, but it's absolutely doable. And it also demonstrates that you're, you're able to get over the hurdle. What could be the most difficult part of building your business, which is finding the money. Most important thing. So universal fact, venture investors have the attention span of a two-year-old. You cannot, you can't send them a 20 page business plan. You have to start with an executive summary, a teaser document, something that's a page long, uh, no more than two. And it has key, it addresses five key points. This is a really good exercise for founders to go through. So five key points. What does the company do? What is the problem with the current state of the, your industry? So, so let's, let's go back first of all, what does the company do? First sentence, the most valuable real estate on your executive summary. Use it to explain what the company does. It's, it, you right away, right off the bat, what you do. Don't meander and talk about other things. Explain what the company does. And then the second part, the second question you need to answer is what the problem is with the current state of industry. So why are you necessary? Um, what is the problem solve? And then the next question is what is your solution for that problem? This way your uh, and how your technology actually offers a solution to the problem that your industry is what does it look like live how to find them is it consumer is it where do you have that you who your market is key this is how your investors get a sense that they will eventually make money from your company and then the last one is how do you reach that market how do you the company reach the market to make money you talk about your go-to-market strategy here you talk about whether there are competitors in the industry whether there are ways that you can carve out market share are you sticky are you able to get that market share so that we don't worry about competitors that fifth question is also key. So these five questions breaks it down really well to deal with in an executive summary. It has to be dealt with. Uh, this is what your investors are looking for. I'll tell you another thing about investors with uh, the idea that they are, have the attention span of two year olds. They like pictures. So graphs are helpful. Charts are helpful. Um, anything that illustrates your point. If you have clients, if you're lucky enough to have clients, Logos of those clients are key. If you want to include a screenshot of something, that's key. Somehow the pictures, that the investors for the most part, quick thinkers, visual thinkers, some, for some of them, the pictures resonate more. So the ideal executive summary in my view is something that maybe two thirds text, one third pictures. Uh, quick term sheet primer once you're ready to get that term sheet. So we talked a little bit about full dilution before, some other terms that are key, liquidation preference. Series C, liquidation preference, uh, 1X, which means one times the amount they invest in. So if an investor puts a million dollars in, they get that million dollars back unless, and this is on, on liquidation, on sale of the company, unless they would get more if they converted to common, in which case the preference goes away and they just participate with the common in the same um, in pari passu with the common. So they're equal with the common at that stage. 
Uh, sometimes series C and definitely series A, we start to see one X liquidation preference with some participation rights, which means the investor would get back their million and they might share with the common uh, to, to participate maybe in full or maybe with a limitation. A uh, current market, which is very good for companies, is we're seeing more of this 1x unless, unless with a conversion to common. So we're seeing more of that. We're even seeing that in the Series A stage. So that's very good for the companies. Uh, dividends, really don't pay dividends on a Series C. Standard for Series A is somewhere between 6 and 8%. Uh, but dividends are not paid unless they're declared, and so we try to say that they're non-cumulative. Another key term, broad-based weighted average anti-dilution, it's a mouthful. <laughs> what it means basically is if you, if you sell preferred stock today to an investor at, let's say, $4 a share, and you do your Series B round or whatever the round is next, and it's a down round, let's say you're selling it at $2 a share. Anti-dilution protection means that your investors in that first round that paid $4 get adjusted uh, so that they don't suffer the full dilution from the down round. And broad-based weighted average is a fractional dilution. It's the most company favorable anti-dilution you can have. And it's as opposed to full ratchet anti-dilution, which in the numbers that we're talking about would result in a full decrease down to that $2 per share that the subsequent shares are sold at. Um, veto and voting rights, there is a laundry list usually of veto and voting rights, especially when you get to an A. Usually your investors want the right to veto extraordinary events, sale of the company, a future fundraise, hiring somebody with a salary in excess of a certain amount, um, increasing the shares to your option pool. It's a whole list of extraordinary events. And usually they, they want the right to veto that. Uh, another typical right, right of first refusal and co-sale. That means if uh, somebody on the founding team usually wants to sell, your investors have the right to buy before you would sell to a third party. That's your right of first refusal. If the investors don't want to buy, but would prefer to sell alongside you, that's the right of co-sale. And, and um, that would be something that may decrease the amount of shares you would be able to sell if your buyer doesn't want to take all those shares. Last provision, drag along, important, important provision for the company. It means that if you have the vote of a board, a board of directors, and maybe the investors, it depends on the thresholds that are set, to sell the company, everybody has to go along with it. So it doesn't allow any minority shareholders to hold things up. It's a very valuable provision. And I think that that was it. Uh, real quick, Venture 101. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, I'm gonna take the screen share back um, and also uh, see if we can get your video going again. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if anybody listening has any questions, feel free to, to type those into the chat box so that we can work our way through them. So, so Lori, um, some of the GoFly teams right now are very, very early on um, in their process. Um, do you have any recommendations uh, for, for how people should think about uh, the split between the amount of time that they should be spending on things like fundraising and thinking about how to structure their corporate entities versus uh, how much time they should be spending uh, on, on technology development if they're a very small team? It's a really good question. So, uh, at the very, very early stages, I would devote as much time as possible to the tech development, uh, especially if you can do that without needing the funds. And the more that you're developing at that stage, the better off it is for you. Uh, because then when you do go out and fundraise, it makes it an easier process if you have a story behind it, if you have a prototype to show, if you have something that, that people can play with. It makes it much easier. Great. Uh, and then in terms of um, 
putting together their uh, company compositions um, as people are growing their teams from perhaps just a handful to a larger number of people. Um, how should people uh, prioritize people with expertise in funding versus people with expertise in um, uh, their technology development? I would prioritize the tech development. I, I think that at the very early stages, you have to get your product built. Uh, the fundraising is going to be important. It's going to be important in the whole life of the company, really. But if you don't have a product, fundraising is going to be really tough. So I would focus more on tech development. Great. And then uh, another sort of timing question, how long should it take up to take to set up your corporate entity? Is this something that takes a day, a week, a month, multiple months? Yeah, an hour. <laughs> it's very simple to do. If you are here in the U.S., it's a really simple filing to do. Uh, if you're outside of the U.S. but you want to set up a U.S. entity, maybe there's a little more complexity with some identification numbers that you need. It's a very simple thing to do. And it's, I, I highly recommend it. I, once it looks like your company or your product has legs and you're going to be doing something with it, set up a company. Great. And, and you talked a little bit about um, intellectual property protection along the way as well. Um, how, how does it work if people are bringing sort of personal intellectual property to the table when they're thinking about uh, forming a, a company? How does that all get sort of wrapped into the company itself and interact with uh, who might uh, currently own that intellectual property? If you're going to do this from a company perspective, the company has to own. So if somebody, if a developer, let's say the, the founder has developed the technology, the founder would technically contribute that to the company. So the company would have ownership rights in it. And your, your investors, when you start to bring on board investors, are going to do due diligence to make sure that that contribution was made in the right way and to make sure that the company actually owns the, the IP. Great. And um, so if people are thinking about um, the timing of protecting their intellectual property, is that something that, that people should maybe consider doing after they have their corporate entity uh, organized and set up? So what I would do from the beginning is those PIIAs that we talked about, have everybody, the founding team, everyone involved, any, any, anybody who's doing anything to do with your technology, sign an agreement that says it's confidential, they know what they agree, it's confidential, and anything they're developing belongs to the company. I would do that first. Then the patent, to file a patent or even, I, I would start probably with a provisional application because it's just cheaper. That's the right way to do it. So I would, I would uh, just make sure you have everybody involved in developing the technology, signing a statement that says the company owns everything. And then eventually as you start to develop it more and it looks like it could be something unique enough to patent, maybe at that point you, you seek a provisional application. Great. And then I know there's a, a little bit of a, a push and pull between the need for um, confidentiality when it comes to uh, intellectual property and the need to reveal certain things to people in order to get people excited about funding. Uh, yeah. Do you have any recommendations for the best way to, to balance those two things? Good, good question. Good. Um, generally, investors will not sign NDAs. Uh, they won't sign NDAs until it gets to a certain point where they look like they're more uh, interested in the company. But you do need to be able to tell them enough to get them interested in the company. That's where that teaser document comes in. You need to tell them enough about what's going on with the business, but you don't have to reveal all the secrets. <coughs> Excuse me. You can, uh, the teaser document is step one. Once the investor is interested, you generally take them through a longer PowerPoint presentation, which could have some more information in it. But you try not to put all of the secret sauce into that document. You do need to share enough to get an investor interested. You can't just say to the investor, come, I want to show you this, but I can't show you unless you sign an NDA. They won't do it. They see too many deals, too many um, business plans, too many executive summaries to feel comfortable signing something right away. The only exception to that is where the technology is so unique you see it sometimes in biotech and pharma. Those investors may sign an NDA at the beginning. Great. And then um, you talked a little bit about biotech companies and some things about software companies. 
Uh, is there any advice you have particular to the aviation industry that people should be thinking about? Um, and if not to the aviation industry, maybe towards things where people do have a physical prototype that might be different than uh, somebody with uh, software code or something. So, so what, what you guys are doing with the flying cars, that's, that is cutting edge and fascinating and fun. Um, I think that investors are going to be really interested in it. One of the things that, one of the hurdles I think to think about is that uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of funds involved in manufacturing. So some investors, when you hear big manufacturing tickets, some investors are good with that, some investors are not. You really have to do your homework and find the right investors who are comfortable with that and know that industry. I think more important in this space is to find the investors that know the industry and are comfortable with it. And then uh, so much of uh, product development is sort of fitting a engineering and manufacturing need, but can you talk a little bit then again about the, the story to potential investors about um, uh, combining that with a, a market need and how people sort of see that technology fitting into um, commerce today and into society today? Yeah, I think our internet connection is doing something a little funky. I'm not sure I'm hearing everything you're saying, but um, so how do we, how do we, uh, I, I think that it comes back to that executive summary, right? The, the five points. So how do you, uh, how do you show the need in the industry for it? I think that there's, there's a clear path in this and what we're doing with the flying cars to show a need in this industry and to show where it leads. Um, the, the industry, the, the transportation industry is evolving so fast right now that this is part of that evolution. And I think it's easy to explain that, but I do think it has to be explained to the right type of investor. Not every investor is gonna get it, but the ones who understand this industry are gonna be really excited about it. Great, and then uh, as some final parting words, uh, from, from where you sit with your specialty, do you, do you have a sort of a, a couple uh, of condensed final thoughts or advice for people that are competing in GoFly? What, what do you think uh, they should be making sure they think about? All right, so, so have fun, first of all. Uh, as an entrepreneur, you're gonna be doing this stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just have fun with it and be passionate about it. If you're not passionate about it, you're not gonna be able to sell it. Uh, and so you gotta be passionate about it and, and be fearless. That's the, the hallmark of a successful entrepreneur is the fearlessness. So good luck with it all. Great, thanks, Lori. And I'll pass it over to uh, Gwen to say just a couple of parting words. Thank you, Lori, so very much for an incredibly informative master lecture. I know all of our innovators appreciate your insight and your expertise. And uh, we look forward uh, to our upcoming master lectures and uh, wish you all a, a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thanks.